Hello, could you hear me? There we go. It's finally working. I mean, yeah, I'm so glad you could make it. I mean, the first thing I really ask is just, where are you calling from? Uh, Texas. Fullerton. From Chickia. In Seattle. Arkansas. Vancouver, BC. Louisiana. And wherever you're tuning in from, welcome to Milky Narder. If you're new here, hi, I'm Spencer, and this is my podcast. On Milky Narder, we hear stories, just personal stories of ordinary people. We hear their life lessons that they've learned, the experiences they've faced, and the passions they are pursuing. If this sounds interesting to you at all, please help me advertise this. Milky Narder is primarily word of mouth advertisement. So I'd love that if you could just help me out and we could spread the word to as many people as possible. On this week's episode, we'll be hearing from Brandy. And with Brandy, we talk about her journey to getting to where she is today, as well as beauty pageants, as well as just goodness. So I was not expecting anything kind of going into this. I thought she was going to take it a completely different way. But no, she just blew my mind and I had not much to say. I just let the words guide me. So for you tuning in, let the words guide you. Just sit on back and really take in what Brandy has to say. So without further ado, I'm going to cue sponsorship and then we'll get to hearing Brandy's story. Let's get right into it for those who don't know you. What's your name and where are you calling from? I am Brandy. I am calling out of Tampa, Florida, and I um, guess I'm calling. I wouldn't say I'm a model. I model as a hobby as far as fashion, runway. I've done pageants. I have one last pageant coming up in December. I'm excited to get out of the way, (laughs) and I'm currently in college pursuing my MPH, but I have a really amazing story. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, where did you start? Where did this all happen? Um, It started when I was growing up. Originally, I'm from San Bernardino, California. And my life there was great as a kid growing up um, until about the age of nine. When tragedy kind of like st- like struck my family, my brother was murdered. Mm. Um. The weird thing about my brother's murder is that his best friend was the number one suspect that he had grow- had grown up with in the past. And not only did I have to deal with losing my brother, I was actually in my second grade class with my brother's murderer's little cousin. So I would get wow. bullied and stuff like that. And then I would have to see his sisters with my sisters. And I remember my sister always telling me, to hold my head up she was a senior in high school when he passed away and was murdered and she had to make the decision whether to go to senior prom or to go you know to bury her brother and of course it was easy for her you know she went to my brother's funeral absolutely and after yeah after that like my life completely changed we moved um due to security issues and my mom not feeling safe anymore because they knew what school we went to They knew where we lived as she tried to seek justice, which she never got. Um, But she did use that strength, I would say, to go into law enforcement as I got older um, as a single mom. So growing up, my dad really wasn't in the picture a lot. He was always working and my mom and him didn't have like the greatest relationship. So it was always like I always said I was a child that nobody wanted, but it's not that I wasn't wanted. I didn't know it, but my mom and my dad split as soon as my mom found out she was pregnant with me. And Mm -hmm. my father was just like, I'll take her. And she's like, no. And then my aunt wanted to adopt me. And then my aunt said, well, then you'll, you know, my mom was a struggling mom with three kids, a son with um, mental disabilities. He's developmentally delayed. All my siblings are like 10 years older than me. I was a complete, like, unexpected child. So my aunt said, you know, you're going to want to keep her. If you give me to her, you're going to want her back. I can't, you know, do the adoption. So my mom kept me and um, we moved to Florida because of my brother's murder. And I remember everything changed. I had grown up in San Bernardino Valley and I went to Rio Vista Elementary School. 
And I, I loved my life. I had like my own toy room, everything. It, when I moved to Florida, I had to reestablish myself. Sure, and my you're about identity. what ten years old at the time. Yeah, I was about nine. I was in third grade. I remember yeah. um, vividly. It was about third grade, and I just remember coming to a whole different foreign like place for me, yeah. as far as like a child, because it's so different. The cultural differences, the way things, the conservativeness of Florida, uh, everything is completely opposite i miss that freedom even to this day and i would love to move back but due to the high cost of living and, <laughs> <laughs> and um the things that I, I went to san diego and it was just really heartbreaking to see like the homeless population and san francisco up there it's just really disheartening it's not the home that i knew when i was little. yeah absolutely things have changed over here yeah, it's changed a lot. And um, once I moved to Florida, I realized that my life was different. We didn't have the same safety net financially. It was just me, my mom, my brother, and my sister. I had to readjust to living without my brother and not having him. I remember the last time I saw him was like over his casket and me having to tell him, not realizing that this was the last time I'm going to see you at eight yeah. years old, you know, nine years old, not realizing this is the last time I'm going to be with you because my mother gave me the decision whether I wanted to go to the funeral or not, because there was a viewing and I chose to go because it was my brother. So of course I wanted to go to say goodbye, but I didn't realize that impact and effect that it would have on me later on in life. Absolutely. You're just and still mom, a child, yeah. Yeah, so growing up, you know, my mom was a single mom. She got, you know, into law enforcement and started, she finished college. She did, and she was in college during the time my brother was killed as well for her AA. Um, she ended up obtaining her bachelor's in psychology, which I'm very proud of her for. But she didn't have the best, like, choices in dating men. And I know she's going to be really mad at me, but <laughs> um, I just heard she married a man who was just not the man she, I guess she thought he was because he wasn't encouraging. He wasn't loving. He wasn't any of those things that I guess a husband you would think would be uh, my sister, because she's so much older than me. She um, started dating a guy. They, they got, you know, married and she ended up having a baby and I was 11 and I remember her daughter passed away and, um, at birth. So right after my brother passed away, so did my niece. So mm. it was pretty hard. They're actually buried right next to each other. So when you can, you visit one, you can visit the other, which really does make it a lot easier on all of our family. But my mom ended up marrying someone that was a complete monster a complete evil, just sick, sadistic monster. I remember at 13, um, I began to run away because he would try to touch me. And mm. what I mean by touch me is he would grope like my butt, like when I was walking past him one morning in the shower, you know, I got into the shower and he's trying to get in the shower with me. And he's like, oh, I thought you were your mom. It's like eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. My mom would leave for work when it was like 630 and still dark outside. Um, so she sent me away to boarding school and it, she said it was to work on her marriage, but you can't work with damage. So, and I don't think she could process it due to all the traumas that she was going through either and being a single mom. So I got sent to boarding school, didn't work. I got kicked out. I got kicked out of a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know what, like. The boarding school, you'd think it would get better, but it doesn't because the guy that, the woman whose husband ran the boarding school, it's called Our Father's House for those that are listening, and Pensacola, Florida, Our Father's House, he was actually convicted and charged with molesting some of the girls there. I myself Holy was shit. not a victim. Yeah, it was a huge scandal, and I was there when one of the first allegations towards him was made, and he would ask girls like to come sit on his lap and tell you know santa what they wanted for christmas just completely inappropriate 
And um, I, after that, I was just like, you know what? Screw this. I, I, I lost, you know, hope in adults, faith in the system. And I was just like, I'm just going to rebel. So I did what eating normal, like, I guess, disturbed and unhinged and just fed up and angry 14, 15 year old would do. I started partying, going to parties more, not even coming home at night, running away. Um, I always say I party too much. So when I was younger, so I don't have to do it now. Mm. Cause I did that until about 18 or 19 to the point where I was so exhausted just from partying all the time. I contemplated before like committing suicide and I was by the, you know, I was very blessed because my kid's father was like, no, you know, you can move with me, start all over, or you can continue, you know, on your down spiral. And he saved my life. So we ended up moving in together and we ended up having twins after this was like a year after I stopped partying and stuff. We ended up having like twin daughters and that's ultimately what made me change my life around was my kids. Wow. But I had lost a desire to party, go out or anything. And as I got older, a lot of the things about my father, my mom had hid. So I didn't know my dad battled with addiction. I didn't know it was something that ran in the family. I was completely unaware because she really didn't talk bad about him to me. So that made a lot of sense when I got older and I found that out as to why my dad couldn't have been there a lot of the time. I've gotten past that. I've dealt with those feelings. So it's helped me be in a much better place. Um, me and my dad's kids, dad were together about three, four years. We separated, which was good. We're still best friends to this day. Um, that's a, one of the most amazing things is I ended up with a best friend. Like, yeah we're best friends we co-parent extremely well and I ended up leaving him I got in another relationship for four years and I was like everything I wanted to do I wanted to travel I wanted to see the world I couldn't do that with this person and they they weren't open to that life so it was completely opposite so I decided to break up with them call off a whole wedding um, I'm kind of like the runaway bride because I've been like engaged so many times <laughs> and I don't make it down the aisle, which is so sad, Yeah. but in a way it's, it's always me that says, no, you know, it's not going to work. So, and I point out the reasons why I just wish, you know, and I feel bad because it's like, you're wasting someone else's time that they could be with someone, you know? Mm-hmm. No one wants to be selfish and take years of someone's life that they can get they they can't get back and invest in themselves. So I ended up going to school after that relationship and going to college. I decided I wanted to become something more in life than just a mom. At about 24, 25, my senior year of college, my life changed. Um, I met a neurosurgeon and he was like he needed an intern. So I was like, okay, I would love to take the opportunity. I was a psych and crime major. So I was just like, wow, this neurosurgeon has an interest in me. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go work, you know, and, and do, be an intern for you. And then plus he was paying me like on, you know, interns, you're not allowed to be paid, but he didn't believe in that. So he was like, I'll still give you, um, I'll pay you in cash, not on the books. So I was like, hell yeah. Like, <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> no to that. Yeah. To build my resume, you know, like what intern's going to turn that down? Like what the school doesn't know, the school doesn't know. And that was very problematic because I started dating my boss. And um, my life, literally, I moved away with him and my children. And we had a whole different realization of the world and the process. I mean, sexual harassment is rampant the epstein thing i can relate to i was sexually harassed by a woman um mm -hmm. i don't want to say her name but i still have the proof the text messages and everything just for purposes that i'm going to use in the future um for a book and it was the one of the worst nightmares of my life and when we split up for a while he kicked me out he called dcf on me like five times with false allegations, which they knew. And I was basically almost homeless. And I said, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna be single for a while. 
and yeah. I was for like a year and then I met someone and I thought I could trust them and it didn't work out they lied about their age by like a 10 year difference plus I mean he was looking for a house with a realtor that he ended up sleeping with and cheating on me with so I mean just that didn't work out so now I'm just back to like being single and finding myself in my own journey and in between those two relationships with the neurosurgeon, I got into modeling, which was a really cool idea. But the thing is, it wasn't really my idea. Hmm. Why was that? It was more him pushing me. It was more him encouraging me. What happened was I went to a Victoria's Secrets in New York and they thought I was one of the angels or a model. And I have pictures they put me in their VIP room and stuff, brought me champagne and fruit. And I'm like, <laughs> what's going on on Fifth Ave in New York? And I'm like, what's going on? And they thought I was a model. And so they actually told me to come back the week after the, the VS models. Some of them would be there with their agents to come back and meet them. They gave me the opportunity. And I'm like, well, I have school. So I called my mom and I'm like, mom, should I stay and come back in New York, you know, and meet them? Or should I come home? And my mom's like, come home and finish your education. You got to remember, this is my last semester of undergrad with two majors. She's like, you're an idiot if you do not come home and finish your education for your kids. And I'm glad she did. So I turned the opportunity down. I don't regret it at all. At yeah. all. Um, I came home and... My ex, you know, was like, you should really model, you know, it, he became more fascinated than I did. So it was like something I did to make him happy to shut him up. But he became very controlling, um, very needy, very um, just, it was unhealthy, is what you could say it was because I would go to a photo shoot, and then they'd be like, he can't come and he would get upset. Um, I remember when I began, he would call people and tell them, oh, she's not going to show up are, you know, cause problems with me and production companies. So it was like, be careful what you, you wish for. And I didn't really have the power and control to do what I wanted to do in the industry. So now that we're not together, I took all the power back in my life. I'm yeah. able to do it as a hobby and fun and still have a career and still be a mom and still raise kids regardless of what the status quo in society is. I'm not ever going to be a freaking soccer mom. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with soccer moms. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There's nothing for sure. wrong with them. It's just not I for mean, you. Yeah. It's really yeah. just not for me. Really modeling. I love it. I have fun. I like to do shoots. I like runway. I'm not attention seeking. So I really don't care yeah, if yeah. I did or if I didn't do something. Um, I really am just a nerd. <laughs> I'm, I, I like my books. I like reading. I like learning. I like documentaries. Like my hobby is traveling. I don't like national. I like going international to other countries, learning about them, learning about their cultures, helping people, educating them because not everyone has the same education opportunities that we have here in America. A yeah. lot of people don't get that. I think it was Mumbai, a guy became a neurosurgeon just from watching another neurosurgeon because they only had like one and like around that perimeter in that area. And I was like, oh, wow, well, maybe I should just retire, go there and become, you know, a neurosurgeon in the country. So mm -hmm. without having to take the state license and medical board exams. Um, so that's what my major is in disaster management, humanitarian relief and homeland security. So there's three elements of my master's program. And I got into pageantry like an idiot because I thought and I felt <laughs> that pageants were um I thought it was based on like your actual credibility of being a real volunteer, which I've been doing for over six years now with my kids at that. Yeah. Um the impact that you've put on your community, not at all. Not at all pageants are money making opportunities for people to have a job they hmm. really are 
I and most of the time, like it's gotten to the point where if I compete in a pageant, I already most of the girls by interview, we all know who the winner is. Everyone knows who the winner is. Yeah. Um, there was a very interesting situation that happened, especially in Florida with the USA system with Genesis Davilia, who I love, who's in pageantry. Um, she used to be. She won and they took her crown. And then she had to go back the next year, recompete. She knew she was going to win that year because she sued like the organization and made everyone step down. They had no choice but to. So yeah. it was like the girls knew she was going to win. She won rightfully so. But if it's a pageant and you're judging on multiple areas and then the areas that they judge in aren't on your humanitarian efforts, it's based all on looks talent i have no talent i mean i can read a book i can do like you know a, a science article i can do a case study those are my hobbies i don't dance i don't sing i'm not like a stage performer so you know it's like pageants are not what people think they are and a lot of them don't represent what they claim to represent it's all about beauty who sells and how the person's going to sell that crown mm as a marketing ploy to get other people to sign up. Now, I'm not wow. saying it's all pageants, but that's the ones that I've experienced. And then I look at the history, like my first pageant ever, one girl was a webcam model. The other one was a failed model, um, allegedly who had an addiction to cocaine and was a complete alcoholic and was flirting with my boyfriend at the bar trying to buy drinks. And, um, I was just like, how do they even let these judges be judges? So I, I, I'm like, after my pageant in December, I'm completely done through with pageantry. I feel like my impact, I can make a bigger impact continuing to do what I do in science and in the medical field. Yeah. I, that's exactly what I want. I want to work overseas in refugee camps, helping to run, facilitate, reduce the exploitation and reduce the slave labor of people in refugee camps and help make my mark on the world like that because we think we've seen poverty here in america there's mm. nothing compared to what you will see overseas and what i've seen oh yeah for sure like people are so poor in countries they can't even afford clothing like, I've seen people with no clothes walking around, not because they're on drugs, just because they're poor. They literally cannot afford such bare necessities. Yeah, and it, we complain about the littlest things, which I don't understand. Like, I see people, because I work as a medical educator in wound care for a hospital, and we have hyperbaric oxygen as well for as a treatment for diabetic patients and patients that have had cancer and late effects radiation and they're so grateful for the care that they get but in america like when you're talking about a population of people we can't seem to agree on really anything or anything with substance our role models that our kids are looking up to don't promote get a job get a career get stability be on your own Learn to love yourself first. It took Absolutely. me a long time. It took a long time for me to love myself. I'm 34 years old now, and I would say it took me until I was about 32, 33 to start that journey of just self-love. Yeah, especially in America. It's more of just teaching the young to be comfortable and live a comfortable life. And when it's kind of time for you to find yourself, you kind of avoid that path. To really just be comfortable stick to what you know rather than trying to figure things out for yourself and seeing how you could be yourself and how to do better for yourself absolutely yeah and it becomes difficult when you have things of like instagram that tell you what you should mm. become or who you should be yeah and, i mean even i get sucked into it too i'm not going to say that i don't my daughters are 13. I see them, you know, emulating not as, you know, graphic or like a lot of other girls do on Instagram, but I see them like doing the post of one pic and then take that picture down and then just post one more. And I'm like, what trend Ugh, is this? Just getting stuck yeah, in the man. loop. Yeah. 
Yeah, then they had like the TikTok, and I'm just like, <laughs> the, the kids, they don't have the same ability to just turn it off either. They're so addicted to it. It's like when you take the 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 social stuff away, they go through withdrawals. Yeah. And Let the sad truth the is that's it's it's all the youth know. They don't know any other they don't know any better. See, that's what COVID was a blessing to us because <laughs> it's freaking crazy because they're at their dads right now in boot camp and they're going through foam withdrawals and they're not having all of the luxuries that they would usually have because the first two semesters are gonna be e learning. So they'll be home with their father and their stepmom, who's a stay at home mom, to have that attention, to mm. have, you know what I mean? That's a sacrifice as a parent. A lot of people don't know that they have to make because I have to go to work from nine to five. My kids are home all day long. I mean, I can't take their phones because what do I expect them to do while I'm gone at work, you know? Yeah. They're lazy teenagers. They hang out in their room. They don't come out <laughs> unless they want to eat or they need something. And then they go right back like little slugs. I try to get them to have a library to read books and they're not into it right of now. Of course. I totally get it. I was the same way, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's really rough with them with COVID. And I don't think a lot of parents understand how bad that is right now with the COVID and dealing with that sure and that's why like i'm glad like some pageants have completely stopped some have postponed but then you have the other ones that are like oh we'll throw it go ahead anyway because of the money aspect of it but you just have to wear a mask i'm like well i'm glad that you care enough to let us wear a mask how about you care enough to not put us in a situation where we could actually contract covid especially when you don't know what people do as a career that they can take and go contaminate and spread it to so many other people because you don't know for the first couple of days that you even have it. Yeah. And you may not so, even have any symptoms, but still be a carrier of it. Exactly. So, I mean, you you don't know, but that just goes to show you how vanity is really put over beauty, over the importance of life. And that's my exact point of why, like, I would rather work overseas than in America. Over there, they don't care what you look like. They don't want to take pictures. They don't want to be on Instagram all day. They want shelter, food, and water, the basic yeah. minimums. So, so what are your next steps, Brandy? Well, my next steps are I'm almost done with grad. So I'm working at the hospital, and I don't know if I want to continue in the hospital administration system Mm -hmm. Once I'm done with grad school, I want to start actually next year going over once COVID is done. It ruined my plans to go to Sierra Leone, Africa, to an orphanage called Natalia's House. I want to be able to make that trip to Natalia's House. And I want to go to places like Haiti and stuff on missions trips and actually yeah. work with those that are impoverished and kind of put the modeling, the pageantry to the side. I want to take my children with me to some of the countries I'd like to visit. Yeah, just get and, them as much exposure as possible at such a young age. Yeah, because I mean, right now they're just being exposed to like um, Pop Smoke, who else? Uh, YMW Nelly. Uh, they have great taste in music. <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to think of who else. They yeah. Like, uh they used to like xxx i like him too he was he was super cool um rest in peace to him for sure and pop yeah. smoke as well god bless them you know and juice world i love juice world like i understand he went through a lot in addiction as well but he always told people you know you can make it no matter what you do and i do believe that he had just like a very kind encouraging soul about him and that's something that i wish he was still here to you know, emphasize to younger generations, but he's no longer here. So yeah. it's kind of sad, but he left the messages in his music and inspiring and encouraging, no matter how depressed he was, he still did it. You his know? message still resonates with so many people. Yeah, I, I really do. And I think honestly, if the kids listen to it from a different angle and perspective, that it would be so much more beneficial to them to sit there and listen to it for hours versus just you know, listening to it for music, they need to see the meaning behind it. And I yeah. think that's what these younger kids growing up are lacking. Like I had Tupac. 
so like <laughs> I heard about problems back then you know dear mama was a song that was you know that in my family and in my community that we could identify with you know what I mean like yeah, Biggie Smalls sure. that kind of stuff I didn't really do Little Kim I'm not really <laughs> into the female rap genre because it's like who's got the biggest butt who's twerking the most I don't know how to twerk either <laughs> I, like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but I don't know how to twerk never was on a pole or twerking um, and that's absolutely okay because it seems like f- kind of after you found yourself it's really all really just been about you and your family and no one else it's just focused on how you and your family could be better that's basically how we can grow tighter too as a community yeah and the community and get more close-knit to like the people around the relationships that we've had um bond with those parents more they're pretty cool none of them are like soccer parents with like a soccer (laughs) fan and stuff so and they're young they're like none of them are over 40 so that's another thing like i can relate to and my kids as their friends are pretty cool. Like I have this sorority house going on with the pool and everything and the waterfall. So they're like, yeah, party at, you know, my kids' house. <laughs> so I come home every day. I don't know what kid's going to be here. <laughs> it's like I walk through the door. That's another reason I'm like, okay, guys, you guys don't understand about liabilities, homeowners insurance, and, <laughs> you know, all those yeah. things. Like what if something goes wrong and mommy's at work? I'm held accountable. So that's where the sacrifice came in, you know, that their dad's like, look, you work, they can come here and then we'll work out. We never had to deal with the courts. He's not even on child support. I got really lucky. Mm -hmm. He's a very good person. So we can kind of manage our co-parenting skills together without anybody in the picture. Sure. Wow. That was a lot to unfold there to brandy yeah so like it gives me a lot of time to do what i need to do as far as like getting registered i know you know what i mean for school classes yeah, yeah. that you got to take for your 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 major and stuff and then with work and everything and just lets me focus on that i don't go out clubbing every weekend actually i do like photo shoots every single weekend the last five shoots the last five weekends i've done shoots actually um portrait Let's see, portrait, lifestyle, brands, headshots. And today I did one that was like a psychology experiment, which is really <laughs> cool because I was fully clothed, but the male model and photographer taking the pictures were nude. Oh. So, yeah, it's like a personality theory, psychology thing. I don't, I can't really, I don't know if I can get into it because they signed a contract, but the job today was pretty different, very unique from a really cool aspect in science. And I could see where the photographer and the guy and everything and the people behind it were looking at as far as like giving research and providing research because he's a grad student too, doing his dissertation, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, yeah. he gets a photograph hot chicks all day um <laughs> hot guys and they, they, some of them get naked and take pictures of the other models <laughs> and you get paid for it um i didn't get nude i don't do nudity but it was pretty cool like you know to be that free but and like i said in california it would be more common but mm. florida is very conservative it's completely opposite it's like a lot of the girls would be like, no, I wouldn't even go to a shoot like that or show up to something like that where there's going to be a nude <laughs> photographer. So it was pretty interesting today. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. So, yeah, because I work six days a week and I usually take one family day off, which is Sunday or um, Saturday. Like last week and I went kayaking in the woods, got spiders in my boat with my kids and it just was not fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's I, I I like the indoors. I don't know. You guys don't have mosquitoes and stuff in California. Uh, not where I am. No. See, we have mosquitoes. We have possums. We have raccoons. We have alligators. Uh, snakes. 
I really miss California right now. Even with- <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I don't. The last time I was there, though, there was like an earthquake, and I was in Vegas too, and that was the first time like I felt an earthquake in Vegas, and I'm like, oh okay, it's it's an earthquake. Everybody else is like, what's going on? And I'm like, just hang, chill. It's an earthquake. <laughs> Yeah. They happen. You know? So yeah. everybody else is like different, but I mean, is there anything else that you wanna like talk about? No, that's pretty much it. I mean, I normally have like ten to minute conversations, but I was just totally encapsulated by what you're saying. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> like no one ever lets you talk in modeling. They don't. You're not supposed to. You're just supposed to stand there and take pictures. Yeah, just so, be submissive and do what you're told yeah. for the pictures. Yeah, do the pictures, get them done as fast as possible, um, go home, and that's it. And I've then worked do it with again. a couple of designers. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you so much for your time, Brandy. I mean, is there anything you want to shout out or just any last minute thoughts? Um, yeah, I want to say that right now is a time, a great time for self-reflection for all of us to just step back, reevaluate what we want in life, where we want to end up in a long-term position, not just for today or next year, but down the road, the next 10, 15 years. Um, I learned the stock market. It's a great time (laughs) to like invest in stocks, um, to help secure your future and secure that bag. Um, yeah. Yeah. And definitely just take the time to figure out what you want and where your life is and are you truly genuinely happy with where you are today and your life and it's not always going to be easy it's not always going to be you know a road of bliss and happiness you will have bumps along the way but you can pick yourself back up you can get back up after adversity tragedy there will be a lot of things that may hinder your road on the way to success but you really and truly can become something if you push yourself to overcome Absolutely. and it may take you know don't be ashamed to seek help don't be ashamed to get therapy don't be ashamed you know to have to call and ask for help because i know that was a big thing for me mm-hmm. i never had anybody i could talk to growing up because I just, I I didn't. I mean, my friends were always getting wasted. So was I. Uh, My siblings are older than me. None of my cousins I could really relate to. I didn't have anyone to reach out to. I had mentors. I really didn't feel like I could be myself. I had to put on a facade. But once you take it off and you look inside yourself, figure out what you need for yourself, not anybody else, but what you need as a person an individual yeah. to make you happy. And I think a really cool part of this uh, journey is once you find yourself, you can kind of understand where you belong in a sense. And you're able to mesh with other people so much better than having to constantly put on that mask or that facade. That's just draining you every single moment of the day. I totally agree with that because I've lost a lot of friends, not really lost, but I just stopped talking to like a lot of people because they're not bad people. They didn't do anything wrong to me, but it's just like our journeys don't align with one another. We don't have anything in common anymore. They're beautiful people, inspirational, but their road is different than mine and that's okay in life. Like I tell my kids all the time, you know, you have friends now and they're such an important part of your social development. But down the road, 20 years, how many of those friends are still going to be in your life? I mean, they'll they'll be lucky if they have one apiece. Yeah. So, I mean, you grow and you evolve and it's uncomfortable and, it, you know, you miss them, but you'll be busy working, doing things that you want to do or need to do to get to where you want to go. And so will they. And it's okay to encourage them and text them and inspire them. You know, I, I do that. But then there's just some people that are just really shitty people and you just have to just really let go. The me, 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 me. So take, 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 take. I had a lot of those for a long, long time and I was blind to it. Absolutely. I mean, even myself, there's those friends who were kind of in a shitty place and they're kind of a little bit of shitty people. And sometimes you just want to take on that responsibility and be like, oh, I could help them. I could make them be whole. But at the end of the day, that's not your responsibility. 
your responsibility is to yourself. Your loyalty is to make yourself happy. Exactly. And sometimes it sucks. I've seen my friends yeah, get addicted to sure. drugs, go and down just dead end roads, get involved in these wildling scams and schemes where it's like, oh, we'll do a model house and it ends up being an OnlyFans account. Um, mm. The exploitation and stuff of people, but it's a lot of it's because they they're searching for something to make them happy and validation but they're going about it the wrong, the wrong way. way absolutely yeah so that's my thing is like <laughs> find who you are yeah and you'll find people in life who whose values correspond to yours and that's how you know you found your group that's how you found your people yeah, I am. You know what? I'm still finding mine. Like, oh, yeah. I, like, I really am still finding mine because, like, I don't tell, like, everybody, like, oh, I model or I do this or I do that. Like, with certain groups, I have to be, they expect a certain version of me. But when I go home, I have to be able to completely take that mask off, completely take off whatever you know image they want it for me and come home and remind myself when i look in the mirror that that's not who i am this is me today and this is me truly as a person yeah i mean that journey never really stops until you die exactly because i mean there are settings where you have to be professional there are settings where you could have fun i mean it's life, but it, that's the, that's why I think like self isolation away from people sometimes is a good thing. I'm a, I'm very extroverted, but I'm very introverted at the same time. Where when it's like time for me to be home, I could live in my house. Honestly, during COVID, if I didn't have, if I had it to where I didn't have to work and just I could do online school and finish my degree, I would do it. Yeah. I wouldn't care about leaving because the end goal for me is. I'll be out of the house eventually, but it's different. I'll be in different countries. I'll be traveling, meeting people. I want to journal their stories, get them out there, do research and, you know, for sociology and record all of the things that are going on around the world, because I don't think people are listening to the voices that are being silenced or oppressed because they don't have media. They don't have those things because of they're super, super poor and then they actually lack the ability to even be able to speak up or have a voice in some countries. Yeah. So someone needs to be around to tell their stories and share them with the world so people can take the veil off and see like, this is what's going on. We're looking at all of this crazy shit with like Epstein and Galeen. These people have been around for years. You see them in the modeling industry, couples, that you know head on models it's it's not something unfamiliar or unknown territory for us mm. but for the normal person looking and they they don't see all the red flags that's why modeling is like the number one source and way of human trafficking in america today and it's really sad because a lot of these girls they don't have anyone to give them that direction they don't have anyone to say, hey, look, watch out for this or that. Like me, I walked in blindfolded. Yeah. I just want to thank you so much, Brandy, for just kind of talking about everything, for your human rights activism, for your passions to really speak out against what is the norm. Well, I I don't think <laughs> there, you can say there is a norm. I don't think we have a norm anymore. I think the norm is what we can tolerate, what's healthy and acceptable for ourselves. I don't really think we can even generalize people's or what a home should be like or what a family dynamic is anymore. It It's very different. Yeah. Times are changing and they're changing fast, but not fast enough. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brandy. I mean... I asked kind of last minute thoughts. Is there anything you want to shout out? Um, yeah, I definitely want to shout out you, Spencer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yes. Anybody who's listening to this, if you guys want to donate to Natalia's house, which is an orphanage in Sierra Leone, please do. Um, 
It is actually ran by a person here in Florida. I personally know, and the items do get to the people in Africa. All the funding goes to the people in Africa. It's not like you see the starving kids with the big bellies. No, they're very well taken care of. They live, you know, in villages that are up kept and maintained from the donations of other people. Also, there's the gentleman's course that is here in Florida. That's amazing. That helps kids as well. There's a multitude of things that people can do um, to help. But my thing is give back to your communities. Don't always take. And I would like to say also thank you again, Spencer. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I appreciate all the time that you've given me. I'm really thankful for it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really glad I'm able to just provide an opportunity and a space where people just talk freely. I know I go into these interviews um, and it's, it's very easy now that I've like practiced it for a couple of years now, but I'm really glad to just listen to these stories and not be so judgmental. You no, know, we're so quick to judge and be biased, but I think that's totally the wrong approach to being in touch with your humanity. Yeah, I, I mean, it really is because we lack empathy. Yeah. I, I think sometimes even I can find myself in that category and being guilty. And that's totally like normal it. that it happens like that. But you have to yeah. kind of acknowledge, okay, maybe I wasn't in the right mindset or not the place I wanted to be. Um, but it's more of just always asking yourself, how can I be better? And I think that's a lifelong question. That's just Absolutely. not something we ask ourselves in a day. We need to ask ourselves that every day. Yeah. And you're never going to have a direct answer to that. No, but that's the good thing about life. It's a challenge. And yeah. it's all about new perspectives, new discoveries of oneself. It never stops. It's so exciting, despite how shitty it is or whatever the shit goes on. You know, it's it's life. Yeah, There's I mean, so much to say about it. Yeah, 2020 is like the year of like, it just does not <laughs> stop every fucking day. There's something new out there. There's something going on. We find out something about something else. And this person's getting exposed. This person's being canceled. Uh, oh. This, per You know what I mean? It's just yeah. it's such a devastating year. But I feel like we need to get all the garbage to the surface to make room for a better society and a better world. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brandy. I'll keep in touch with you and let you know what's going to go on with this episode. All right. Thank you so much, Spencer. <laughs> you have a good afternoon, okay? You too. And it's uh, like six o'clock, so, or almost yeah. seven. So you should probably get to eating dinner. Exactly. All right. And try to be the soccer mom, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. So hopefully there's something you could take away from Brandy's story. She came from a really bad place mentally and she was able to go beyond that and rise, not let the incident of her brother define who she is. She moved on and now she's living possibly her best life that she could possibly live. Thank you, Brandy, for being the guest for today's episode. Thank you, Luke Rumbo and Matthew May for the tracks I use in today's episode. Of course, if you're interested in being on Milky Narder, find me on Instagram at underscore Spence underscore R underscore. Search up other Milky Narder sorts. Help me spread the word. Remember, word of mouth advertisement. It's been a nice, you know, just talking to people. And especially with my schedule getting really busy now, I'm not too sure what the direction of Milking Ardor is going to be. I'm not sure how often I'll be able to post, but so far, it's been really great. That being said, make sure you're getting notified for when the episodes are being released every Saturday. I love spreading the word, so if you could just tune in every Saturday, that'd be great. Thank you for making everything happen, and until next time, I will see you later.